here with you once again. Uh, I was trying to figure out how many years, maybe seven or eight, nine years ago, I was up here, and, and uh, the other time, I don't know how many times I've been up here in, to the church, and I was really in a bad way the last time I was here, and, and uh, I was uh, I was under a heavy burden, and it was all to do with a large kidney stone that had lodged in my right kidney, and. Uh, my urologist told me the week after I went to him, after he, he dealt with it in the emergency room, he said, Mr. Phillips, he said, I would not have dared told you this the night I got to you at the emergency room, he said, but I've seen people die from what you, your, the shape you were in. It was, it was poison in my body. It was uh, setting off infection in my blood. And uh, I... I told him, I said, well, I'll always thank God, number one, then I'll thank you, Dr. Kiner, for what you did. But I was wearing a stand, if any of you ever had a stand, God help. Uh, also, the thing I ever had to deal with, and I preached, uh, preached here that week, then left here and went to Tennessee, and preached another week with a stand. So anyway, God got me through it, amen. amen. And uh, it's just a blessing to come back up the mountain and to be here with you folks. Thank you for the mic, for the invitation. And, uh, we, say, we see a lot of you on Facebook. And, uh, you know, and so we can sort of keep up a little bit with each other on that, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, years ago I preached against Facebook. I said, you bless God, you need to get your face out of, off of Facebook and get it in the book. And lo and behold, I got on Facebook. I can't, <laughs> can't preach against it now. <laughs> but I'm on it. But yeah, I'm glad Linda got to come with me. Yeah. And uh, we're we're a few years older than than when we were here the last time. And uh, our steps are getting slower, but we're still stepping. Amen. And I thank God for His great mercy and blessings and grace. I'm glad that. He is a merciful God and uh, grateful for his faithfulness to all of us. Yes. So I trust um, uh, coming tonight, I, I wish the family could have come. Uh, uh, they've had a very busy weekend and then we got to leave out Wednesday morning for uh, Batesville, Mississippi. That's about an eight or nine hour drive. And so they just got in over in the morning from Ohio. But I sure wish they could have come. They would have made me look a lot better. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe have even uh, uh, helped me sound better. Amen. If I look around, I see some, some, some familiar faces I remember from uh, those years back. And so it's good to see uh, these young people here tonight. Amen. Good to see that. What a, what a blessing that, that, that is. And I praise God for what the Lord's doing in, in this church and, uh, and uh, what he's doing through Brother Mike and, and his ministry. Amen. I want you to take the Word of God and let's find our place in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 8. Mark, chapter number 8. Uh, for the message that I feel God would have us to uh, bring tonight. Let me cut my mic on it. All right. See, I told you to wave at me a hog. I'll probably forget. All right, can you hear me now? Amen. So in Mark chapter number 8, and uh, I certainly don't have anything new to tell you as far as that goes. Uh, you may have never, never heard much about what I'm going to preach about tonight. I don't know. But it's in the Word of God, and it's been preached and been declared down through the years. And uh, recently, or back in these days and in these times, I felt a burden to preach to our folks back home. As he said, I've been there 41 years, and you think that I've done preached everything uh, that I know, and then a lot I don't know. 
But I felt a burden in my heart in these days, several months now. I believe y'all believe just like I believe. I believe y'all believe that we're in the end times. This thing, folks, is just about over. If you can't see that, uh, I feel sorry for you. You need to go to the eye doctor. But I'm here to tell you, we, this thing's ticking down, and I don't believe we have a lot of time left. And uh, that's good for God's people. It's good for the church. It's not depressing. But I believe that God is getting ready to get his bride out of this wicked world. And he's going to take her home. So I've been a burden about preaching uh, messages that uh, deal with uh, salvation. And uh, I, I, did a, I did a series just recently. A uh, three-part series on three rich poor men in the Bible. Three rich, they was rich in this world. And the reason I know they were rich, because the Bible said they was. And, uh, but they wound up poor. And it's sad that a lot of people are going to find that out, but it'll be too late. That's right. That their riches did not buy them anything in this world and for the next world. And then what I'm going to preach tonight, I preached uh, some while back, and um, there's three words in the New Testament that jumped out at me, and uh, and I, 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 they got in my heart, and so I wanted to preach on one of those words tonight. I will mention the other two. And the first word is out of Hebrews 2, 3. And it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The word that jumped out at me was the word how. How shall we escape? Yes. If we neglect so great salvation, you say, escape what? Well, I believe he's talking about the wrath of God. Yes, How shall we escape? I hope that you found the answer to that word, how. Another word that jumped out at me is in 1 Peter chapter number 4. And Peter writes to the saints and about the suffering they're going through. And I'll just mention the one verse that I got my thought from. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 18, Peter said, If the righteous scarcely be saved, and I looked that word up. I was curious about the word scarcely. It seemed to, seemed to uh, annoy at me. And I said, what in the world are you talking about? If the righteous scarcely be saved. And I learned and found out that that word scarcely means not easy. Not easy. Did you know tonight it's, uh, it's not easy for folk to get saved? I wish it was. <laughs> I wish it was easy tonight for people to come to the altar, come to church, uh, come to us and say, Preacher, I want to get saved. Yes. But it's not easy. Right. It's difficult. It takes, I still believe, I'm so old fashioned, I still believe it takes the Holy Ghost conviction yeah. to deal with a sinner's heart. Yeah. And that don't just happen by the snap of your finger. Right. Think about when you got saved, how long did God deal with you before you got saved? Dealt with me for several years. I didn't realize it, but I, I was troubled in my soul and I was afraid if I died I'd go to hell and, and it just came Kept bothering me and, and troubling me as a young teenage boy. And then when I turned 16 on a Sunday morning when the Holy Ghost moved in that church service, I want to tell you, I got gloriously born again. Yeah. It's not easy, folk. If it was, I tell you, I, I'd, be, I'd be dragging them in. I'd be bringing them in. Come on in. Uh, come on, come on. But it's not easy. Now, you may get them to make a profession, but uh, that 
that may not be the case with salvation. And so he said, if the righteous scarcely be saved, here's the question that got me on that. He said, here's the word, where? Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Yes. Wow. I thought, my goodness, if the righteous scarcely be saved, he says, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now you think about that for a minute. We're leaving this world one day after a while, in the rapture or by the way of the grave, we're leaving this world. And I want to ask you the question tonight, where are you going to appear? Where are you going to show up? Where are you going to be? Yes. I'll not turn there for the sake of time, but Revelation chapter 20 and about verse 11, uh, John the Beloved shows where God sets up court in the heavens and the great white throne judgments comes into, into being and, and he calls up the, the grave and the dead and, and the sea gives up the dead. And, and, uh, and, and one of the saddest statements in the Bible is found there in that, in that story about the great white throne judgment. And the Bible said, and there was no place for them, no place for them. I thought, my, how tragic. To be strung out yonder in the universe and to be judged by a holy God and there be no place for them. They had nowhere to appear, beloved. And, of course, they wind up in the lake of fire. So that word where got to my heart. I want to ask you tonight, not only do you know how, you shall escape but do you know where you're going to appear when you leave this world but I want to preach tonight on the third word that uh, came to my heart and my mind and it's probably more familiar than uh, the other two I don't know but anyway here in Mark chapter number 8 Mark chapter number 8 as I had you to turn there now I've turned my Bible now I want you to notice in Mark chapter number 8 Jesus is talking here Jesus is speaking and the Bible says in um, verse number uh, 34, I'll begin to read. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples. So he calls the general uh, people, the common people unto him, and along with his disciples. And he says some interesting things to them. He said unto them, Whosoever shall come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus, we know right there, is talking about discipleship. That he, that whosoever will come after me, you're going to follow me, you're going to become a disciple of me, Jesus said. Then I want you to know the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, things you must do. Let him deny himself. Boy, that's a big order. Wow. That's a big order. And then he said, let him take up his cross and follow me. Cross is a symbol of death. And so he's telling us that if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to be a follower of me, then you must die to self. And he said an interesting thing in verse 35. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. This is a paradox. This is an oxymoron. It, it seems to be a contradiction of our thinking that whosoever shall save his life <laughs> shall lose it. You spend your life trying to save your life, trying to, trying to you know, be what you want to be and, and uh, live in the life that you want to live, then you're going to find out uh, down the road that you're going to lose it. But on the other hand, he said, whosoever shall lose his life, and notice the next three words, for my name's sake, whosoever shall lose his life for my name's sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Yes. 
those who feel sorry for folks who sell out to God and give it all to God. They said, poor folks, uh, they'll never have nothing, never amount to nothing. They're the ones that are really living the life for Christ. But the question that comes to me tonight, Jesus seems to turn to the crowd and the disciples were uh, there and he said in verse 36, For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It seems that Jesus has turned from talking about discipleship and he wants to emphasize relationship. Because you cannot have the right discipleship if we don't have the right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And so the word I'm going to emphasize tonight, as God has sent us this way, this is what my heart feels. I want to emphasize tonight the word what. How shall you escape if you neglect so great salvation? And he says, where shall you appear? on that day of judgment. But now he says, what? What shall a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? What is he going to profit? And what is he going to gain in this world? if he loses his soul. You know, I know I'm probably preaching tonight, we say many times to the choir, uh, you, you know, you assume on a Monday night that everybody that's here is, is uh, saved and, and trusted the Lord Jesus. And I, I told my church lately, I said, I, we come and we assume that everybody in the congregation is saved and, and born again. But, but you know, I've come to realize that we're, Brother Mike, we're preaching to another generation in these days. I mean, listen, and I, I, I don't know but what they may be somebody here tonight that, that needs to answer this question, what? You may need to answer the question, how shall we escape? You may need to answer that question, where shall the ungodly and the, and the sinner appear? So I want to notice tonight, notice with me, we're going to get into the message here in just a moment, but the biblical count, the biblical count tells us that we are made in the image of God. God made us unique and distinct. God made us special and, um, and, and so we are, we are made by God. I'm going to turn there in just a moment. The Bible refers to our body as the earthly house. 2 Corinthians 5 1 said, if the earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a, we have a house made in heavens, not made Made with hands. I'm here to remind us tonight that this body is just a tent. It's just a tabernacle. This body is not going to remain uh, forever. We, we know and it isn't an interesting that we spend most of our life uh, uh, pampering and, and trying to pet uh, our body and at the same time neglect our soul. Well, people are more interested in the outside than they are on the inside. Amen. Oh, what a, now I know, uh, I I'm, I'm thank God for my body. I, I thank God that he gave us a body, and I'm, I'm grateful for that, and I believe we ought to keep it up, and I believe we ought to do all we can. But I want to tell you, my friend, this body is, is going to, like a tent, it's going to fall one day, and it's going back to the dust from whence it came. And so Jesus taught that it is a bad thing for us to, to uh, try to exchange our soul, uh, my friend, for this world. I want to mention uh, two or three things tonight along this line. I want to emphasize, number one, I want, I want to say something about the value of a living soul. The value of a living soul. What a priceless treasure that we have uh, within us tonight and it's called a living soul. Amen. It's priceless. It's a treasure and uh, Paul even told the Christians 
Corinthians that we have this treasure uh, in earthen vessels. And so it's priceless. It is, it is a great uh, gift of God. And so uh, what makes our soul valuable? You ever thought about that? What makes our soul valuable? By the way, uh, just for uh, information, we are a three-part being. Uh, the Bible teaches that we are spirit, soul, and body. Uh, Paul, when he wrote to the Thessalonians and finished up in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, he said, I pray God, your whole spirit, and notice how he arranges it. Notice how he gave it. And most of the time we say body, soul, spirit. But Paul said, I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are a spirit, my friends, and then we are a soul. We are a soul. Our soul is from which we operate. Our soul is our mind, our emotions, and our will. Our body is just the house that the soul dwells in. Are you with me tonight? Amen. And I believe y'all y'all believe that. Amen. And so uh, the soul, the most valuable, the most precious, the most treasure thing we have in us tonight is that soul. What makes it valuable? I want to give you five things that I believe the scripture teaches us that makes our soul valuable. Number one, I want to say our soul is valuable because the person who created it and who made our soul. Let me go back to Genesis and if you want to take time to turn that'll be fine. Or if you're not just listen in to me. In Genesis early in our Bible as we begin to read. Notice in Genesis 1 26 and God said I like it when God speaks. He said God said let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air uh, and over the cattle and over the, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So we notice there in verse number 26 that the Bible plainly clearly tells us that God said. What did God say? God said let us make man. Now that's, that's interesting to me. Uh, he didn't just say let me make man. He said let us make man. So that means there was somebody else involved in the creation of our soul. It means what he say preacher? It means God the Father was there. God the Son was there. And God the Holy Ghost was there. And the great triune Holy God got together and said let us let us make man. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, my friend, you know what makes something valuable? Who made it? That's what makes it valuable. Yes. Amen. This wasn't no, some little two before carpenter. Amen. This was the living God. This was the holy God. This was the eternal God. This was creator God. Hallelujah. And then over in chapter 2 of, of Genesis in verse 7, and the Bible said the Lord God formed out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Yes. That's a whole lot easier to believe than some of this junk that they've tried to cram down our children's throat. Yes. My God, anybody, you know, some folks got a lot more faith than I have. I couldn't believe, I could not believe that junk that they try to present to us. Yes. You say, what is it? Well, it goes something like this. Once I was a tadpole, beginning to begin, then I became a frog with my tail tucked in. Now I'm a monkey swinging from a tree. Then I'm a professor with a PhD. <laughs> they expect you to believe that, John. Right. Amen. Yeah. Isn't it just wonderful to open the Word of God and see that God said, God did, God made, God created us, my friends. And listen, that makes it valuable. That makes Makes it precious that the that the Lord God of heaven and earth, who made who made it, adds to its worth. You find that out in this life. Sometimes it's a certain artist, and if a certain artist painted that painting, it makes it worth a whole lot more. 
And so even in Ephesians, the New Testament, in the great book of grace, Ephesians 2 and, uh, and uh, chapter 2 and verse number 10, uh, he said, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I know he's talking about our salvation there. But thank God, he is the person who made us, yes. made our soul. God made your soul. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Oh, I noticed the second thing about the value of a soul. The value, the value of a soul is not only the person that made it, but the purpose for which the soul was made. The purpose, it was made for a purpose. If God made it, then it was for a cause. It was for a reason. God don't waste things. God made it for a divine purpose. And what was it? God's great purpose was that His children could be conformed into the image of His Son. Yes. That's why God made the soul. You notice that He said, He said, let us make Him in our likeness and in our image. Amen. In other words, Son, what do you think about it? Let's just make Him uh, like us. Holy Ghost, what do you think about it? Him. Let's just make him like the sun. And they all agreed together, praise God, in unison. And they all agreed, said, let's make him in our likeness, in our, in our image. In other words, make us like God. Not make us God now. Don't go there. They are some of these far out fruit loops that will tell you that, you know, we're little gods. Oh no, we're made in the image of God. We're the only part of God's creation. Out of all that God made, recorded in Genesis 1 and 2, all that God made, we're the only part of God's creation that is literally made in the image of God. We are the stamp of God's image upon us. That's why we're a trinity. God's a trinity. He made us a trinity. He made a spirit, soul, and body. And so, my friends, God's purpose was that we might be conformed to the image of His Son. Romans 8 and verse 29. Verse 28, we all know well that, that we know that all things work together for the good to them that are the call according to His purpose. And He said that we might, He predestinated us. He predetermined us. It was already fixed in God's plan. He, he pre predestinated us to be conformed, to be shaped, to be made in the image of His dear Son. Yes. Now don't get shook up about that word predestination. It always, when it's mentioned in the Bible, speaks of people who are already saved. That's right. Just thought I'd pass that on. Amen. Yes. God predetermined, God sovereignly planned that His this part of His creation. Now, I got to think about this. Before the fall, can you imagine how wonderful it was with Adam and Eve in the garden? Man, before sin, I mean, God come down in the cool of the day, and man, he was hanging around out there, and God come down and fellowship with them, and I mean, uh, no distractions and uh, nothing to hinder their fellowship, nothing. I mean, this pure, holy, righteous uh, before God, and God, and, and Adam and Eve uh, uh, just worship God. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, don't have any Bible to, to prove it, but a, but a guy that's a pretty sharp fellow, uh, in, in his uh, theology and in his Bible, he, he somehow believes that Adam and Eve was 33 and a half years old. It was, they were about 33 and a half years old before they sinned. No Bible to prove that. Just think about it for a moment. Jesus, they were 33, uh, well we could say, uh, hypothetically saying, that they, if they were 33 and a half years old when sin came in, then the second Adam, the last Adam, was 33 and a half years old when he dealt with sin on the cross yeah. and took care of sin. Just something to chew on, amen? amen. All right, don't gag on me. <laughs> don't gag on me. 
But let's just imagine if he lived 10 years in that wonderful, blessed atmosphere of perfection and holiness and righteousness and purity and God just walking with them in the garden. Man, I tell you, that had to be, that had to be wonderful. That had to be blessed. Then all of a sudden we know what happened. The old sly devil through the form of a serpent slipped into the garden and beguiled Eve and, and deceived Eve and, and led her into sin. And, and then Adam came along and uh, he, 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 he bit of it too. And my friends said, so they sin. And now God comes down to walk with them and fellowship with them in the cool of the day. And they're not in church. They're not there that Sunday morning. Uh-oh, something's happened. Something's went wrong. And God cries out, Adam, Adam, where art thou? Not that he didn't know where he was. He knew exactly. He could have went and tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, Adam, what are you doing here, buddy? But he wanted him to know where he was, just like he does us. Yeah. Yes. Amen. And so that fellowship was broken. God, it didn't catch God by surprise. It didn't catch God off guard. God already had a plan before there was ever a problem. God ain't never had to rush out at like an emergency team and to salvage a situation. No, God had a plan and he told that plan in Genesis 3.15. He told the devil, he told uh, Adam and he told Eve, he said that the, there will be a, a conflict, there will be enmity between the woman's seed uh, and, and so forth. And he said, he said, Mr. Devil, I'll have you to know that the seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. The serpent shall bruise his head. Right there was the cure of our salvation, the cure of our sins. Amen. Thank God. So God went into salvation mode. God went into to saving man. And what's, what, 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 what is it that he saves when he saves us? Well, it sure ain't our body. It's our soul. So the purpose of the soul, even to this very day as we sit here in Christianburg, Virginia, we sit here on a Monday night. God's holy purpose is still today, saving souls. Amen. And when he saves that soul, redeems that soul, takes up residence inside that soul, and I believe when you're saved, I believe your spirit is quickened. Ephesians 2, 1 said, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sin. So I believe when you get born again, I believe life comes out of death and you're quickened by the Spirit, and the Spirit is that part of us that worships God, that, uh, that, is, uh, that, that approaches God. Our Spirit is that that communes with God. So the Holy Ghost came on the inside, quickened our spirit, and therefore the Spirit responds to God. The Spirit, my friend, worships God, and the Holy Ghost is in there carrying it on. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. All right. So let me tell you the third thing about the value of the soul. Why the soul valuable? Well, the person that made it and the purpose for which it was made. And number three, there is what we learn as the permanency of the soul. Our soul will exist for eternity. I said at the beginning of this message, I said, this body is going to decay. You can paint it, you can prime it, you can pump it, you can pamper it, you can do everything you want to, you can peel it, uh, that's P-I-L-L, <laughs> you, can, you can peel it, I mean you can medicate it, you can do all these things that you want to do to it, and that maybe those things are okay in their place and in their time, but I'm on here to tell you, this body is headed right back to that dust right. from which it came. Right. Yes. But the soul that God put in you, the soul that God put in there, will never die. Right. Our soul exists for eternity, either in heaven or hell. 
And one of those messages I preached at our church a few weeks ago on the third rich man that died. We all know it. Luke chapter number 16. And the Bible said there was a certain rich man who, uh, who fired sumptuously every day. And, uh, but then there was a beggar named Lazarus that laid at the gate of the rich man. And both men died. Jesus allows us in that story to walk from this life into the next life and see what it's like on the other side of death. And Lazarus being a, a, a saved, a born again, redeemed brother was carried by the angels to paradise. But the rich man died and in hell he lifted his eyes. They was as much or more alive after they crossed over to the next life than they were in this life. Yes. Amen. If you want to see what the next life is like, then read what Jesus said about it in Luke 16. Amen. It's real. Right. Their soul was still alive. Even the rich man, his mind, his emotions, his will, his thoughts, his memory. Because Abraham said, remember, in thy lifetime, You'll have all your capacity. You'll have all your capacities. You'll have all of your, your being. When you leave this world, you'll either be enjoying it in the presence of God or you'll be tortured in the flames of hell. The soul is permanent. We used to sing a song years ago in the old church hymnal. And it's, it was an old song that says, Where the soul never dies. Yes. Y'all sung it? And I'm telling you, folks, we're headed to a place where the soul will never die. When we leave this life and when this body collapses in death, the soul goes to be with God. When, uh, who was it, Re uh, when uh, Rachel was giving birth to Benjamin as they entered in near Bethlehem, I like the way the scripture words it. It says, as she was giving birth to little Benjamin, and her soul, as her soul was in departing, her soul was leaving her body. That's exactly what happens when our loved ones leave this life. Their soul departs their body. And they they go to the next world where it's going to be permanent. But I'm here to tell you tonight, the soul is permanent. It's permanent. Let me say a fourth thing about why the soul is valuable. If you don't get anything else tonight, please get this. It's valuable because of the person who created it, because of the purpose for which it was made, and because of the permanency of our soul. But it's valuable because of the peculiar peculiarity of our soul. What do you mean by that, preacher? I mean by that that it's rare. There's the rarity of the soul. Let me, let me, let me uh, say tonight that our souls are absolutely unique. Yes. and different. Every one of us in this building tonight has a soul. And every one of us are different. Right. It's rare. You know what makes something valuable? When we find out how rare it is. Did you know there's, a not, there's not another you on this earth and never has been and never will be. Right. There's not another you. Your soul is absolutely unique. And you know what that does? This is a blessing. That makes you special. Please don't ever let the devil tell you that you're a nothing and a nobody. You got a living soul. You're special to God. You're rare. You're, you, you, you absolutely different. I get amazed at personalities. And, you know, um, gosh, I hope I don't get on too much on this, but, uh, but even dogs, animals have a body and they have a soul, but they don't have a spirit. 
And my wife and I did have, oh my goodness, two little long-haired Dotsons. And we went through a tragic with one of them about a month ago. That's another story. And I noticed in both of those little Dotsons how different they were. I could give, I could go to give them a little bone and uh, the brown one with, which came down with a terrible disease that paralyzed her hips. And we wound up, we wound up on a Saturday evening trying to save her life on the campus of the University of Georgia's veterinarian hospital and school trying to save her. And it wound up with no hope. We had to have her put out. She was fine from here up. But I noticed when I would feed them in the morning after I took them outside, I would give them a little, little bone and the little brown one that passed would gently take it out of my fingers, just so gentle. And the little white one, <laughs> and, she, and she was still got the little white one, and she still does it. I mean, they had different personalities. The little brown one was so lovable. I mean, just she had. She, I never thought in a thousand years a little dog would get its paws wrapped around my heart like that little dog did. But I'm here to tell you, here's two grown adults who cried like babies when we had to make that choice to put her down. I mean, it was tough, and yet it was a dog. I've always been one to believe an animal's an animal and so forth, but one I know that and all that. But I'm here to tell you, if you've got a little inside door, inside the animal, you know how, how much they can get close to you. But I'm, I'm making a point here that even in the animal kingdom, that uh, animals are different to have a soul. Now somebody said, the dogs go to heaven. Well, I don't know. I haven't really got that nailed down yet, but I know cats don't. <laughs> well, I thought you would laugh about that, but that wasn't too funny to most of you because you got a cat. Amen? I'm just joking. Please don't take me. Don't take that serious. But we're, we are peculiar. <laughs> And I've met some peculiar folk in my lifetime, just like you have. But let me give you this fifth thing, and don't miss this one. The soul is valuable because of the person who made it. <laughs> you won't find no greater person than Creator God. The purpose for which it was made, the permanency for which it is, and the peculiarity of our soul. But what makes the soul valuable is the price of our soul. The price. The price. Did you know the worth of something? You know how the worth of something is determined? By what somebody is willing to pay for. I can see some of you lightening that and brightening that right now. You know why our soul is so valuable and so precious? Because it drew the Son of God from heaven. Right. It drew Jesus and He came down the, 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 the starry stairways of glory, came down to this earth, went into a virgin womb, and lived a sinless life and died a vicarious death, shed His blood, gave His life, buried in a tomb, rose the third morning. Why did He do that, preacher? Because He wanted to save our soul. Woo! Hallelujah. Thank God for the saving power of the blood of Jesus Christ. All of us ought to shout to the heavens tonight and praise God that he left heaven. He left everything behind. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The scripture said though he was rich, yet for your sake, my sake, he became poor that we through his poverty might be made rich. I say, woo! Hallelujah. Thank God for a Savior. Thank God for saving Somebody that cared for my soul. And by the way, as I think about that, who in the world would have wanted our soul? It was lost. Who in the world would have wanted our soul? 
It was depraved by sin. It was in the darkness of sin and evil. Who would even care about it? I know one that did. Boy, I wish I could preach just like I feel it. Amen. <laughs> Thank God. That's why your soul is valuable tonight. Because it cost heaven everything it had. That's right. Don't you think so? because salvation is free, it's cheap? No, salvation comes with a great price. Yes. Let me see where I'm at. All right. We'll try to get out of here before the Waffle House close. <laughs> no, I'm going to wind down here just a minute. I've said some things to you about the value of a soul. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world? If he could gain the whole world and lose his own soul. I want to say a few things about the vanity of a liberal soul. Not only the value of a living soul, but the vanity of a liberal soul. It's a bad deal to bargain, to try to bargain and try to exchange our soul for this world. Yes. It, it's a bad deal, I'm here to tell you that right now. You say, why, preacher? Let me give you three things right there. Number one, nobody has ever gained the whole world. I mean, since the dawn of man and the creation of man to this very hour, men have come and men have gone, and many of them had their sights set on taking the whole world, many generals, many uh, warriors, uh, many kings and potentates have tried to take the world in their hand. You've studied about them in history, but I'm here to tell you tonight, as we sit here tonight, my beloved, nobody has ever gained the world. Nobody. Number two, the part of the world you gain, you can't keep. If you could gain part of the world, we'll slice the whole world in half. If you could gain half of this world, if you could gain uh, a, a one third of this world, if you could gain uh, a one, a one, uh, 25 percent of this world, if you could gain 10 percent of this, you can't keep it. Right. Right. You're not going to keep it. It's a bad bargain. And number three, the world will never satisfy you. Right. If you gain the whole world, guess what? There'd still be an emptiness inside. Right. There'd still be a crave and a desire and a lust to want more. It wouldn't satisfy. Moses looked at all the pleasures of Egypt and everything Egypt had, and the Bible says by faith he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith he forsook Egypt. He forsook the treasures of Egypt. He left it behind because he knew he couldn't keep it. Jesus said in our text tonight, whatever you try to keep, you'll lose. You'll lose it. And by the way, ask Solomon if these things satisfy. Read the book of Ecclesiastes, his final book about life, and how many times you find the word vanity in that book. It's vanity. It's vanity. And let me say, to lose your soul, you listen to me now, to lose your soul would be a tragic loss. And I say four things. To lose your soul, it would be the most tragic loss that a person's ever had. Number one, it is irreversible loss. You can never reverse it. If you lose your soul, it is eternally lost. You can never change it. You can never say, oops, I'm sorry. Right. You can never, you can never, uh, uh, you know, reverse 
Loosen your soul. Hebrews 9, 27, mostly quoted at funerals. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. My friend, Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 4, listen to this, 18 verse 4. He said, Behold, all souls are mine. That's what God said. Your soul, my soul, they're all his. He made it. He lays claims upon it. But, you know, if you're not repentant and saved and born again and in the family of God, then uh, it's still his soul, but it's a lost soul. But now notice, he said, All souls are mine, as the souls of the Father, also the souls of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death, but uh, it's death. That's eternal death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. My friend, listen, it's, it's a tragic thing to lose your soul. Not only is it irreversible, but it is immeasurable. You cannot measure the loss. How are you going to calculate that on a computer? How are you going to find the figures that will ever come up to tell you how much you lost? There's not enough computers in this world to calculate the loss of a person who loses their soul. There's not. Number three, it is a irreplaceable loss. You cannot replace it. There won't be no replacing of our soul once it's lost. Number four, it is an inexcusable loss because you didn't have to lose it. You didn't have to lose it. You don't have to lose your soul. And that's one thing I like about the soul that God gave us in the beginning because we're the only creature, again, on this earth, this, this world, that has the ability to make a choice. Did you know that? You made a choice this evening. You made a choice to come to church. Now, it may have already been predetermined in your mind, but some of you maybe wondered, well, should I go tonight or maybe go another night this week? But you made a choice. You'll make a choice tomorrow about something. And so, we're the only creatures on God's earth that has that gift or that ability from the Creator to make a choice. And I believe that we are, we are responsible. I believe, I believe the gospel of whosoever will may come. Yes. He said, whosoever will, believe. I was thinking today I took our car by this drive through car wash, and then you go to the outside of it, and they have the vacuum and the stuff that you do for the inside. And so I was just vacuuming it out and stuff, and, and I'd laid my, uh, my mat out on the, on the ground, out on the pavement. And, uh, and so, lo and behold, a lady come that works there, and she had took, uh, took my mat. <laughs> I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> she had took my mat, and she had hung it up on their little thing there, and she was washing it. And I said, ma'am, I said, you don't have to do that. I didn't say I wasn't going to do it, but I said, you didn't have to do it. She said, well, I don't mind. And so we're, we get to talking, and so I said, ma'am, and she asked me about where we were going, and I said, well, coming up here in Virginia, i got to preach tonight. I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. And she asked me where I'm going. And I said, ma'am, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? And she said, well, she says, uh, I take care of dogs. She said, I assume she helped out in some kind of humane um, thing with animals. And I thought, well, that's good that you take care of dogs. I like dogs myself, and, and uh, I like to be kind to them and everything. And I said, uh, ma'am, I said, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And he shed his blood and gave his life, and he rose again from the dead. And I said, the Bible says 
Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I tried to sow the seed of the gospel into her heart. Because here was a woman that was thinking, being good and kind and uh, uh, reaching out to animals, unfortunately, homeless animals or whatever. I don't know where all this stuff goes. But here she is. She's thinking that that's going to merit her a place in heaven. I was nice to her. I was kind to her. But I tried to give her the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's a shame that many people think today that, that what they're doing is going to gain them interest into heaven. You don't have to lose your soul. And I say last of all, and this will just be brief, just a few moments. Not only the value of a living soul and the vanity of a liberal soul, but the vainness, the emptiness of a lost soul. I can't think of anything more vain, more empty, more sad than of a lost soul. Many are engaged in bargain, bar bargaining away their soul. It started out in creation, and it's continued to the day and hour in which you and I are living. You say, what do you mean? Think about a moment, two men in the book of Genesis that's, that bargained their salvation. One of them was the first brother that came on this earth. His name was Cain. Cain bargained, was bargaining with God when it come time to gather and worship. Cain thought he'd bring the best vegetables and the best fruits of his garden. Gather it up and bundle it up in a big old fruit basket and bring it and set it before God and God would be pleased with that. Cain sold his soul for a basket of vegetables and fruits. Cain, the first brother that put his foot on this earth, as far as I know, is in hell tonight because he bargained with God about his soul. Abel brought the lamb and shed the blood and realized the only way you could approach God was through a sacrifice and a substitute. Another man in Genesis sold his birthright. His name was Esau. He was the firstborn. He was to get the blessing. He was to be the priestly figure in the household. But he didn't take his birthright seriously. He had a choice to make. He had a decision to make. And you know what it was. When he came in from hunting and he was so hungry, someone said he could have boiled his boots and eat the soup off of it. But his younger brother, Jacob, had cooked a little bowl of pottage and sat it there in the kitchen. And Esau was starving. He was craving. He was lusting for something to eat. And he said, I want, I want that pottage. I want that soup. And Jacob said, you give me your birthright. And you can have it. Esau sold his soul for a bowl of pottage soup. And Hebrews records it and said Esau sought for a place of repentance and he never found it. A lot of people have sold their soul for very cheap things, very unvaluable things. They sold the most valuable thing they had. They, you've heard the phrase, they sold their soul to the devil. Well, there's many folks that have done that. May have been over a little moment of pleasure, a little moment of fun, a little moment of drinking or taking dope or, or, or bad things that you can get involved in this world. And it captured your mind and your soul to the extent, to the extent that you sold your soul for that little bit of pleasure. And I want to say that's a sad, sad commentary. And so tonight I feel like I've delivered what God sent me here tonight to preach. I know I said God, there's probably nobody there but just Christians, saved folks. Folks that already know the Lord, but, but God sent this old country preacher by tonight to ask the question one more time. What 
shall you give in exchange for your soul? What will it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? What's going to be the profit out of that? It's no profit. It's all loss. It's all loss. What, what are you giving tonight in exchange for your soul? You're just making a deal. You're making a, a bargain with sin and Satan in this world, and you're selling your soul for some little cheap piece of money or fame or pride or self or religion or whatever you're selling it out for nothing nothing even if you could gain this whole world let's stand together as we pray father we believe tonight that we've obeyed you we've done what you put in our heart to do Lord Lord, and I pray the Holy Ghost now will take it and uh, work it in the heart of every person in this building tonight. And I pray that we'll take serious inventory and examination into our heart tonight. And Lord, ask yourself the question, what will it profit? If I exchange my soul for this world because this world's not our home we're just passing through Lord I pray that you'd cause our hearts to be made aware again tonight of how valuable how precious how wonderful the soul is that God made us how unique how special we are and that old slew foot devil will slip up on the shoulders of these young people and tell them that they're no good. Tell them they're a failure and they're, they're a nobody. And many of them will plunge into some evil and they'll want to be liked and they'll give in to peer pressure and give in to other things that will just destroy and doom their soul into hell. God, please. Please, Holy Ghost, I can't convict a soul, but Lord, I preach your word, and it can convict, and the Holy Spirit can take it and drill it into the heart of every individual. God, please, if there's one here tonight that's struggling with their soul, their salvation, their eternal destination, the place where they will uh, live forever and ever and ever and ever and never, never be able to get out. God, Holy Ghost, we commit these moments to you. Do the work that man can't do, but only you can do. For Jesus' sake and for your glory, hallelujah. All right, heads are bowed.